Thank you for joining us for the Utah Energy Code Lunch and Learn today. Today's topic is legislative updates on both residential and commercial energy codes. Thank you for joining us. My name is Becky Robbins, and on behalf of the Governor's Office of Energy Development, along with Dominion Energy and Rocky Mountain Power, I want to welcome you today to today's training. Uh, these Lunch and Learns are a free series that we offer almost every month. We will be taking a break for summer, so just keep in mind that we won't have any after May, but the next two, well, I should say today's one of them, and then the next one will be on residential energy code. But we do have two full day trainings coming up that we wanna make sure everybody knows about. So April 25th is on understanding insulation choices and improving the thermal envelope, and that will be a full day training with building science expert Gord Cook. So it's not to be missed. He's one of the top building science experts who will be talking about best practices, common mistakes, just going over the gamut of how to make the right choices when it comes to insulation and the envelope. And that, of course, will be uh, also provided, the information will be provided by Brent Ersenbach on the energy code and how it meets energy code. So that training, again, is uh, April 25th, and you can find more information on our website. And then on April 26th, you'll find our commercial HVAC training called HVAC Technology Challenges and Solutions. And that is also a full day training, and that is also with Gord Cook, who again is an expert when it comes to energy code training. And uh, both of those trainings, you can find the registration on our website. So just for everyone in the audience, just to let you know, we are being videoed right now. So if you could please turn your phones off and just uh, be careful when you get up. I think our audience probably saw some people coming in just now, which is totally fine. So just keep that, be aware of that. Um, we do want to let you know that our website is just chocked full of great information. You can find all the trainings, all of our quick guides, and Brent will be going over the, some of those today. And that website is utahenergycode.com. So just a uh, great place to find out where you can attend training and register. So uh, we will be taking a break at noon for those online. So we will have a screen that we'll say we'll be back in a few minutes and we'll be having our lunch here and we'll start back again around 12.10. So just keep that in mind. Um, I'm now gonna go ahead and uh, introduce our partner in these trainings. Um, we have Salt Lake Community College's Alyssa Kay, who's the program manager of the energy management program, as well as a mul multiple certifications. I'll let her explain. So I'll turn the time now over to Alyssa. Thanks, Becky. Um, so speaking on behalf of the Energy Institute at Salt Lake Community College, we're excited to partner um, to help put on these uh, these trainings, we feel like these are really valuable, so thank you for being here. Um, the Energy Institute at Salt Lake Community College is an award-winning program that provides clean energy training for advancement in your career in engineering, facilities, HVAC, lighting, and energy. All of our instructors are highly qualified professionals currently working in their respective fields, and our curriculum is developed by a program advisory committee made up of highly qualified industry professionals. So whether you've been thinking about going back to school um, to boost your, techni your technical skills and your resume, or you need relevant <coughs> training opportunities for your employees, the Energy Institute has a wide variety of programs offered in flexible formats. So here's what's coming up. Enrollment is open for the Energy Management AAS degree, which teaches residential, commercial, and industrial energy efficiency, including HVAC, lighting, automation and controls, as well as financial analysis of energy improvements. <coughs> the degree is offered in an accelerated format and can be completed in as little as 18 months with online and evening classes to accommodate working professionals. The next block of classes begins May 28th, so coming right up. Our solar certificates are offered twice a year and it only takes two courses to complete a certificate in solar sales and one additional course to complete a certificate in solar installation. The majority of coursework is online with in-person hands-on training at our new solar training yard um, on the West Point campus out by the airport. And this certificate prepares students to take the NABSEP exams. The HVAC Energy Analysis Certificate begins in May. This is a great option for HVAC professionals and builders who would like to learn more about commercial HVAC systems and how to optimize these systems for high performance. Um, this certificate is uh, 
has an add-on component. Um, you can also take an additional class to get a certificate in energy control strategies or an additional class to get a certificate in energy modeling. Um, additionally, we have certificates in energy efficient lighting and energy accounting for business. So if you'd like to learn more about any of the programs that we offer, um, I'll be here today so you can come talk to me, pick up a flyer here, or uh, you can visit our website. It's really easy. It's just slcc.edu slash energy. All right, thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, Alyssa. Now I'll go ahead and introduce our speaker, Brent Ersenbach. He's an energy mechanical code specialist at WC3. He is a recently retired building official at Salt Lake County. His previous experience included 33 years in HVAC contracting, and for five of those years, he's been a professor here in the energy management program. He's past president of the Rocky Mountain Gas Association, and he also serves on a number of mechanical and building code committees, both locally and nationally. I'll turn the time over now to Brent. Thank you, Becky. And Becky, can you make sure everybody have, has handouts, please? That would be great. Good to see a lot of familiar faces and some faces I haven't seen for a while or maybe in other locations. Um, and it's great to be talking about energy again. Uh, I have to just second or give kudos to Alyssa and the community college because they make this so much easier for all of us to we know where we're going, we have you know, a good facility, and it's great that you guys can kind of rely on, well, it's gonna be at least on this campus, it might be in a different building, but they're just wonderful and uh, help us do this rather than have to chase around and try to figure out, okay, where are we gonna have our next one? And I, Becky already mentioned who our partners are in this. Um, many of you know my last seven, eight years at Salt Lake County, the Office of Energy Development contracted with the county for a half of my time to do this very thing, to teach energy code classes and to be a resource to answer questions and to respond to your emails and, and such. And so as I left the county, the state wanted to continue the program, so I went as I went to work for WC3 on a supposedly part-time basis, it isn't quite so much part-time, but uh, WC3 and the state came to an agreement and so I continue you know, that training like this and um, and happy to help you with your questions. And so I do provide group instruction and answer questions. Uh, I can give you some advice. I'm not going to design your systems, but I can advise and provide individual training sessions in your jurisdictions or in your company or uh, whatever the case may be. And of course, we do have a limit on the funds, so I can't sp spend every single day doing that. But uh, so far, it's worked out really well. Becky mentioned this website. All of these lunch and learn presentations are recorded and located on that website. For, um, and that's good, for example, because today in the second half of the hour, we're going to talk about commercial energy, the new th features in the 18 code. Well, last month we talked about the lighting portion of that, and so we can skip over that. And if you miss that, you should just go to the website, and you can, you can see that video and see the handouts and resources we had for that. So that's a great resource if you have some of these handouts that you'd like more copies for your for your office, you'll find a number of those things there. So the 2019 legislature finished up mid later March and adopted all of these 2018 codes. And I don't need to read the list. One of them, and the one that we're kind of interested in today, is the International Energy Conservation Code, the IECC. But they adopted the commercial provisions only. They did adopt the mechanical and fuel gas code, and there are a couple of things in there that kind of bleed over into energy, and so we'll talk about a few things there. And there was no ac action as far as adoption on the 2015 IRC, the residential code, or the residential provisions of the energy code. And I think most of you are aware of that, that when we adopted the 15 code, the direction from the legislature at that point was, 
we're going to stay on the IRC for six years and then we'll consider adopting again in six years. Um, unfortunately, there's some really good things that are builder friendly in the 2018 code that you're not able to take advantage of. Don, do you have a question? Let's get the mic to let's get the mic to Don. Well, I'm going to have you ask again when, so people out there can hear. Didn't the feds mandate adoption of the, of the 18 code, the IRC 18 code, the energy portion of that, or was it the 15 code? Well, the, the feds have never come out and said you absolutely have to adopt that code. The most recent thing I heard from the feds was that if you're in an area that receives FEMA money to, for rebuild, you absolutely have to build to the most current code. So if we had an event and FEMA came in, you know, and provided money to, to help the rebuild, we couldn't say, oh, okay, well, we've on, we're on the 2015, you only have to meet that. If we want to be eligible for that money, we have to, we have to go to the most current. I pass the mic to Brian if Brian has well, some. Yeah, the FEMA provisions of that act was for public, publicly owned facilities, not privately owned facilities that had to be under the current residential code. I was in a call with a national group and they, they alluded to that, so maybe I better check on that. But at this point, I mean, if you look across the country, you go to ICC's website and you can go to the whole country and pick the state. And for instance, Colorado, the jurisdiction can select what they want. And some are at the 18 level, and some are higher than the 18 level, and some are less, and then there are states that don't enforce anything. I think it's, I think it's appropriate time to say we have jurisdictions here that choose not to enforce the energy code. And that's one of the reasons we're having this, is we're trying to work on that to get jurisdictions to fulfill their obligation and to your question, Don, really, as code officials, we both have licenses. We're actually required by the terms of our license to enforce the code. And if we don't, we're actually guilty of unprofessional conduct. So, um, now I, I, I wish we adopted the most current code. It's really hard to catch up when you have to skip a cycle. So, um, if you're wondering why the colors, I tried to color and I'm trying to kind of standardize in my presentation. The text I use represents the color of the book, so you kind of get in the habit of, when I turn around, I look for the purple book, I know it's the mechanical code. Um, one other thing, we have numerous new amendments to all of um, the codes, and some are included for the mechanical fuel gas. and we even have a few changes to the 15 energy code that we remain on. So we'll cover those. So House Bill 218 continued. That was the bill that adopted codes. Um, if, you, if you have this document in front of you, we're going to refer to this a little bit later, but um, this is a summary of the residential energy code and in red text are the things that were amended in 15. Those all remain in place, uh, but we had one change take place that's different than what the 15 code and the 15 amendments was. And that has to do with uh, moldy family townhouses and stuff. So with the action of the legislature, there's a new amendment that says multi-family homes, townhouses and multi-family, three stories or less, if they choose to blow or door test, they only have to meet the five air changes per hour at 50 pascals. They don't have to meet the three and a half. The single family dwellings, the rest of the, re you know, the residential buildings, single family dwellings dropped from five air changes per hour to three and a half air changes per hour. And that was supposed to happen January 1. It already happened. That didn't take any legislative action or anything. The only legislative action was for um, this one up here to 
give the moldy family builders the break because it's harder to seal that common wall. Things that automatically took place due to the, the text of the 2015 adoption in 2016 was if you use the Utah res check, 2012 res check with an equipment trade-off, you have to pass by not 3% but now 4%. So any of your jurisdictions that are um, you know, looking at those res checks have to pass by 4%. Did you have a question, Brian? Yeah, I do. Um, Let's wait for the mic, please. In House Bill 218, Substitute 2, which was adopted, they're allowing penetrations, through penetrations of the common walls in townhouses and duplexes and that sort of thing. So how are you going to get five air changes an hour when you have an undetermined number of openings in a common wall now? Isn't that a kind of a... Well, it's going to be a challenge for them. They're going to have to, they're going to have to seal them. Well, you only seal them with a fire stopping. That's not, that's not a environmental necessarily. Uh, you know, that doesn't have a rating for air changes. Uh, and I agree. And really, it's not. You know, the the unintended consequences of making an amendment, and I disagree with the amendment. I didn't think that they should amend and allow all the utilities to pass through the common wall in a, in a townhouse, you know? And actually some, some uh, jurisdictions kind of brought this forth because they were requiring electrical and all the other utilities <coughs> that were allowed to pass through, and they were mandating that some of these developments run the power and everything else around. And, um, and in fact, the representative that wrote the bill, he spent sixty dollars or $80,000 on a townhouse project to run all this other stuff around that the code didn't require him to do. And so that kind of, that's kind of where it comes. Troy. Yeah, this is not the only example, though, of municipalities not requiring things be done that are mandatory in the code that contribute to homes being leaky. I, th I think of mechanical rooms that have naturally drafted uh, appliances in them and, and require um, combustion air. They're supposed to be uh, in an enclosed room. I see, I see those that are not in enclosed rooms uh, all the time and the <coughs> municipality is fine with that, but they're still requiring them to meet the blower door testing and they're failing, of course, because they have an eight-inch hole in their house. And it's, it's if you're going to enforce the blower door testing, you should probably enforce the mandatory items that contribute to successful blower right. door testing. Just my humble opinion. Right. One more bet. the yeah. state amended that out of the code. No, no. It's, it's amended for what out? That, that requirement that that room be isolated. No. The requirement for the isolating of open combustion appliances remains in the code. It remains in the code. Now, it, these are great questions and great comments. And really, as a builder or a design professional or a code official, this is the requirement. The requirement on a townhouse is five air changes per hour, 50 pascals. If they choose to run the utilities through and they penetrate the common wall, then they need to make sure they seal the common wall so they pass the blower door test. And they need to do all the other things that they need to do to pass the blower door test. Now five air changes per hour is not that tight. And yeah, it's a little bit difficult in townhouses, but as I discussed this with Representative Schultz as he was putting this bill together, um, I mentioned to him that we have products now that you can actually seal you know, we have a, a company that has a, a spray product that they pressurize the building and they basically seal the building over a couple of hours with a aerosol spray that just finds and seals the leaks. So the technology's coming, the technology's here, and maybe by the time in 21 we look at it, you know, it'll be here and it'll be, it'll be a lot simpler. But yeah, some of them might make it hard, but 
when they, when they make the amendment or when we have the code requirement, that doesn't say, well, it's going to be hard, so we're not going to worry about that one. The next thing is we, we've had this graduating increase on duct blaster testing of ductwork. Uh, up until January 1, if you had 35% uh, of your duct outside the thermal envelope or more, you had to pressure test the duct, duct blaster it. That number dropped to 25%. So really, any duct outside the thermal envelope, you should be pressure testing it because you're just throwing away that air. And the leakage rate has decreased from 8 CFM down to 7 CFM which is still way leakier than the code is without amendment. Um, when you really think about it, 7 CFM per 100 square feet means you have a 2,000 square foot house and how much air are we throwing away? 140 CFM? That's not the duct surface area? Usually that's duct surface area. No, no it's, square feet of, it's square feet of floor area, of conditioned space. In commercial, it's the other way, yep. So, I need to touch on this simply because I'd, I'd be negligent if I didn't mention this for a couple of reasons. And there's, there isn't, well the changes that took place in 2019 do impact this. The initial, the 2015 residential code and the 2000 18 residential code require every home to be blower door tested and every home to be thoroughly inspected for air barrier and proper insulation and all that stuff. The amendment that we're working under says, well, you, you pick, do you want the comprehensive inspection or do I want the blower door test? And the blower door test in some cases, many cases, is cheaper than doing everything you have to uh, on that comprehensive inspection. The other thing that the amendment did is without amendments, every home in Utah would have to test to three air changes per hour at 50 pascals. That's the code requirement. That's been modified and raised to five. And then it just dropped down to three and a half. So we're close on a single family dwelling to the test level that the 15 code stated without the amendment. So we're approaching that three. Well, with the unamended code, we had to be at three, but we had a trigger in the code, and we have a trigger in the code that says, if you're tighter than five air changes per hour at 50 pascals, you have to mechanically ventilate. So since all of our climate zones in Utah require three without amendment, and the trigger's five, every single home in Utah since 2015 code came out, technically should be providing mechanical ventilation. Everybody clear on that? And it was put in there because of building science. It was put in there because when you get a house below five, the house is, I, I don't want to say the word too tight because I don't think you can make a house too tight, but the house is tight enough that we need to make sure we mechanically ventilate and provide fresh air into the house and exhaust contaminants from the house much more efficient than having a real leaky house that maybe leaks some of those contaminants, but it doesn't leak all of them because you just leak around the perimeter. So anyway, the code change that came about in 15 says, no, we don't worry about mechanical ventilation until you get to three. So we have 40% in there that actually is too tight to not have mechanically ventilation, mechanical ventilation. And now we just changed to three and a half. And so what, what are we doing? We're right on the border. Now you guys that do blower door testing, if they have to reach three and a half, what's the, what's the possibility they're gonna be hitting three or lower? It's real. Yeah. So they hit the th three and a half by enough that they drop below three then they should be doing the mechanical ventilation. You know what, they should be doing it anyway. We really need to start thinking about all the builders out there, all the design professionals, all the code officials, we really need to be aware of this mechanical ventilation thing. 
we're creating homes that are going to have issues over time if we don't be aware, you know, if we fail to recognize the need for mechanical ventilation. And so that's why I put this slide in because, I, I mean, we have to talk about it. every time we meet, we have to talk about this. We can do it by supply, which means we bring in a little bit of outside air with our furnace. We can balance it to whatever the requirement is, whether it's 60 CFM or 100 CFM. Run the fan continuous and we're, all, we're pressurizing the house and then it leaks out the same quantity we bring from outside. Or we can put a high efficiency fan in it and leave that running all the time and so we just leak in air to replace it or we do a more effective and balanced system with heat recovery or energy recovery ventilation. Uh, Becky, question back here. If a house uses the continuous fan operation, it, does it, our energy code mandate a minimum CFM per watt or whatever, however they do that? Great question. I have a slide in there. Okay. How, how's that? Okay. And in fact, we have an amendment that I haven't talked about yet that actually came with House Bill 218 that addresses that. So we have these three options for mechanical ventilation. This is the most affordable and it works until you get a really, really tight house where you can't leak enough air. And if it's real tight, neither of these work because you can't leak it in or you can't leak it out. If you choose this option, that furnace absolutely has to be a variable speed ECM motor furnace. They use like a fifth or less of the power that a standard PSC motor uses. And so that's, that's a mandatory if they want to use that route. The thing with continuous ventilation, when you hit where you need continuous ventilation, the code requires, and it requires it because building science tells us to do this, you do it continuously. Now you do have the option that you can do one hour every four hours, so you can only do it, you only have to do it 25% of the time, but you can't go any wider than a four hour span. But if you do that, what do you have to do? That one hour every four hours needs to be four times the rate. So if you needed to move 50 CFM continuous and you only do one hour every four hours, then you have to move 200 to make sure you're still exchanging the same volume of air as you do that, that ventilation. And so, it was the next slide even. We, we had a, a nice surprise, Kevin Emerson, Utah Clean Energy, um, was, he was a bulldog and he kept after Representative Schultz on trying to get a few things in there. He proposed a number of things from the 2018 code and the HBA and the representative um, agreed and put in Kevin's amendment, which is basically the ventilation efficient efficacy, fan efficacy requirements from the 2018 code. So we actually have, if we're doing mechanical ventilation, we have to use high efficacy fans. If we, the furnace is the source, it has to be an ECM. And um, this I just need to make sure you understand this does not apply to just your standard bath fan that's just installed for intermittent use. If your bath fan is your choice for whole house ventilation and you're wiring it so it just runs all the time, then it needs to be the high efficiency fan. If Troy. Is high sorry, Becky. This is an easy way. Is is high efficacy defined Wait. as does high efficacy have a definition of uh, CFM per watt, or is it just ECM? <laughs> I think it does. If I recall, it does have, there's actually a table in the code. <laughs> uh, that's a great question, Troy. That means you're listening. <laughs> yeah, it's right in front of you. Um, 2015. What's the difference on it? We already have this, and maybe we haven't been paying attention. 
Now keep in mind this is if it's your mechanical ventilation. So if you can use your range, range hood for mechanical ventilation, you could say, I'm going to use my range hood for mechanical ventilation. I'm going to put in a really nice range hood. I'm just going to leave it running all the time. When I cook or something, I'll, I'll turn it up to high speed so that I have an increased amount of exhaust. But it's just going to sit there and run nice and quiet. Well, guess what? It's not going to be a $79 range hood that you buy at Home Depot because it has to have a minimum efficacy of 2.8 CFM per watt. And that's a, that's a pretty efficient fan. That's a really efficient fan. Uh, so these numbers were already in there. So if you're using any one of these things, then that's the efficacy that's required. So if it's a fan between 10 and 90 CFM, it's 1.4. But if you're up to a bigger fan that's greater than 90 CFM, it, the efficiency requirements double. So you need to... Um, we need to be paying attention to this. Now the, I'll say the name, the Panasonic and then the high-end fans that Braun and others make typically meet these requirements. In fact, some of those fans, you look at the specs on them and then look up the, the current draw on your doorbell transformer and some of these little fans are drawing less power than your doorbell transformer. It's kind of crazy when you think about it. The 2018 code added this so that if you have HRV or ERV, you have to have that um, efficacy on the unit. And you might say, well, that number's kind of low. I believe that number includes both motors, and so each motor, you know, is more efficient, but we're moving, we're moving, we're mechanically moving air into the building and mechanically removing air from the building. And so we are going to use twice as much energy as we do that. Any questions on that? Okay, we have a couple of amendments in there. And I appreciate the questions. Don't hesitate to ask or if you need a clarification on something. We had two energy-related amendments that um, came out from the Mechanical Advisory Committee that I work with. And it was vending of direct vent appliances with PVC pipe and retrofitting furnaces in existing multifamily projects with common vents. And perhaps those don't make much sense to you right now, but we'll explain. So. Here we have a 80% efficient gas furnace and we have a lot of apartment projects that were built prior to 80% efficient furnaces. In fact, I installed hundreds if not thousands of furnaces in multifamily projects in the 70s and early 80s and we did what we call a common vent and I'll have a slide on this and we hooked the furnace up to it and we hooked the water heater on it and as we went up through each story we just hooked into the same vent. You know, so you'd put a common vent all the way through all the floors whether it's three or five or, or eight floors and you just tied in and the vent increased in size as you went up through. Well, when 80% efficient furnaces came around, we had to change everything. And one of the reasons is those furnaces that I was installing when I was young and I had hair who has hair the color of this guy right here, dark, dark hair, um, were 60% efficient. So they wasted 40%. And what did the 40% do? It kept the common vent warm, right? It kept it warm so that it would draw, naturally draw the product's combustion out. So we come out with 80% efficient furnaces, and those furnaces go away. But 80% furnaces by code and by manufacture require some upgrading to the vent system. And they require you to use double wall connectors and all that stuff. And they said, well, you can still use common vents, but you have to, like I say, do these double wall connectors and everything. And then they threw in another requirement that you can't common vent anymore unless the furnace rooms are outside the unit. So how do we change out 
those furnaces and still comply with the code. So that's our problem. So that's the first one, and we'll have some slides on that. The other one is direct band appliances, and a couple of you guys heard this yesterday because you were at RMGA. Um, when we go to the 90% efficient furnaces, what are we venting with? We're venting with plastic pipe. And so we're bringing in outside air here into the top, and there's the burners, and sucking it through all the heat exchangers and blowing it out. What's the temperature of this vent? Well, it's typically 100 degrees, 110 degrees, or something like that. But we do have occasions when that vent might experience hotter temperatures. And so we have two amendments in the code that address both of these issues. So let's go on to the first one. The code, the code requires that um, the plastic vent, the PVC vent on the 95% efficient furnaces, all the manufacturers of that PVC pipe say, we don't want our pipe used for that. Every manufacturer. And Don probably remembers that some of the code hearings, there's been some real arguments about this. Because Charlotte Pipe and all these people say, no, we don't, we don't approve our pipe for use in that application. It's only rated for 140 degrees, and if you go over 140 degrees, you're going to have problems, and we don't want the liability. So they're opposed to it, so what the manufacturers of the furnaces and the boilers say, well, we approve it for our appliances, we'll take the responsibility. And so the code says that plastic vents for Category 4 appliances shall not be required to be listed and labeled by the pipe manufacturer, but is what it's really alluding to, where such vents are specified by the appliance manufacturer and installed in accordance with the appliance manufacturer. So in the mechanical advisory, um, one of our members who's a uh, mechanical engineer, Roger Hamlet, Colvin Engineering, has seen some failures in boilers. And so what we did is we wrote up an amendment to the code to kind of relieve his concerns, which we all agreed with. And it says, the plastic vents are not required to be listed and labeled, still says what the other one said, when you comply with all the following. Specified by the manufacturer, you install it in accordance with the manufacturer's installation instructions, and the vent gas temperatures do not exceed 140 degrees Fahrenheit. When would the temperatures exceed 140 degrees. Typically, it's in a boiler. Now, let's think a little bit. How do we get real high efficiency? A 95% efficient furnace is removing 95% of the heat that's available when you burn a cubic foot of gas. And it does it because we have what? We have 70 degree air or 65 degree air coming through the return. We have a good temperature difference, and so we can remove a lot of heat. I have a tankless water heater in my home and my vent gas temperature is down in the 70s and 80s sometimes because why? Because I have cold 50 degree water coming in and it's able to remove all that heat as the water moves through the heat exchangers. So we recover all the heat and we hardly have any heat going out in the vent gases, right? What if you have a boiler though that you're heating to 180 degrees and then you're sending the water out and you take some out of it, not all the BTUs, and it comes back at 140 degrees. And then you apply a flame to it to heat it back up to 180 degrees. You simply don't have the temperature difference to have the heat transfer because we don't, we simply don't have the temperature difference. And so what we're gonna have, we're gonna have a vent gas temperature that's above 140 degrees. The pipe's not rated for more than 140 degrees, so you start baking the pipe, and you can actually um, start deforming the pipe, and you could actually have pipe failures. Now, it's a pretty hard one to, um, Roger suggests we just outlaw it all com together completely, and we, I knew that wouldn't fly, and so this, is, this, was our, um, this was our compromise. Now, it's hard for you as a code official to say, well, what's the vent gas temperature? Well rely on your mechanical contractor to tell you what he's doing and to make a judgment on what that vent gas temperature is going to be. So boilers with high return temperatures, that's what we're trying to address. 
the common vent thing, and I'm, I put this one in, and I really want to talk about this one because this is really going to encourage a lot of these projects to move towards high efficiency furnaces. Because we had nothing in the code, and all of us as code officials says, well, what do we do? You know, if Ryan calls me and says, I got this project, and I got to change out furnaces, and they don't want to upgrade to 90%, and, you know, what do we do? Well, we had some issues. Dominion was occasionally shutting people off and saying, you got you to meet the code. Well, in some cases, it's $3,000 or $4,000 to change the furnace, but it's $10,000 or $15,000 or $20,000 if you have to create shafts and put all these new vents up through the building. So it's just not... It's just not logical to have to do that. So where we have this common vent situation where they're all tying in as that vent goes up through, if they are in a room separated from the occupiable space, so it's an apartment project where you go out the patio door and you got a little deck and the furnace is in there, it's perfectly legal. You don't have an issue. You change the furnace, you make, put double wall connectors on it, everything's good. What about all those thousands and thousands of units that we did back then? that have the furnaces inside the unit. How do you address it? And that was the occasion um, that I ended up, I actually ended up on Gephardt over the stupid thing Trent remembers. Um, and one of the things I committed to do was try to fix it. And so this is, this is what we did. So if you have, this is only applies to existing systems. When you have that common van application where the code requires it has to be outside the, the occupiable space, the exception where you don't have to meet that fully is the original it requires these, these six items. The original installation was compliant with the existing code at the time of installation. The dwelling is equipped with a current operable carbon monoxide detector installed in accordance with the current code. The AHJ, the authority to have a jurisdiction, the building official, has approved a replacement based on extreme difficulty of an installing an individual category one vent system or a direct vent category four appliance. So that is saying that the contractor needs to touch base with the building official and say, hey, I'm in this apartment project. We have this common vent situation. Here's what we have. Am I okay to change it? change it out and put 80% furnaces back in. And what the building official should say, can you install a 95% efficient furnace and just vent it out the sidewall? Well, if it's going to require tearing the unit apart to get the vents in and everything, then the, the AHJ would say, no, that's extremely difficult. Yeah, go ahead. Put in the carbon monoxide detector, put in the 80% efficient furnace, and make sure the room's not used for any other purpose and we have combustion air properly provided to the space and we have a proper gas uh, vent top on the, on the vent system. So this doesn't just give them an automatic pass. If it's possible for them to put in a more efficient furnace, this exception says put in the more expensive furnace. Question here? Where'd the, where'd the mic go? One small question. Does this apply to water heaters? That's good. Brent, one small question. Does this apply to water heaters also or just furnaces? Well, it says appliance. The way it's written, yeah, it would apply to a water heater too. Yeah. Good point. You know, our focus, I'll be honest, our focus is really on the furnaces, but we kind of coattail water heaters in with, you know, we put a furnace and a water heater in those closets. So, at least it gives us some direction. You know, I've, I've probably had 50 calls from HVAC contractors over the years. What do I do? What do I do? Well, do a good job and make sure it's safe and, you know, it, it's a tough one. So, anyway. So, in the next few minutes, I want to just kind of review real quick what we just talked about, and I want you to pull this little sheet out. It's in front of you. It's the one that um, has the Utah. Um, don't want you to confuse it with the announcements for other trainings. And let's, 
I might even have to get glasses out so I can look at my sheet. Did anybody have any questions on that, what I just went through? I went through it pretty quick. I want to make sure you understand. So going through this sheet, and you know what, I'm going to suggest for jurisdictions, we had a meeting, Becky and I had a meeting with some other people a few weeks ago and we were talking about how can we get jurisdictions to, to become more proactive and start enforcing the energy code. And we talked about, well, do we need to make checklists? Do we need to, you know, what are the things we can do to hold your hand to make sure that we, we get some, you know, some uniform enforcement across the state? And as we talked for a little bit, I think Mitch was there at that meeting too, yeah. Um, we kind of agreed that we already got the checklist. It's right here. You're doing a plan review on a residential building. All you got to do is pick up, up this sheet. And what's the first thing? R401.2 compliance options. First thing you ask when you're doing a plan review, first thing you ask when you're submitting a plan for permit is which compliant option, compliance option did I, am I using on this, this house? And we'll just briefly go over it real quick. Prescriptive, you know, just follow the table. And the table's right here. If you beat this table completely, that's compliance with the code. Or we do the UAR alternative. We do a res check. You can comply with the code. Or you do a simulated performance alternative you have one of these gentlemen that's a HERS rater provide a performance model and if your proposed building is going to use less energy than the standard reference design home you comply with the code or you do the ERI uh, the energy rating index path and we've talked about that in the past and I think that we got a presentation on in fact, I just did one for the code officials down in Aspen Grove two days ago where we talked about the ERI path. You comply with the code or uh, we talked about this already this morning. The Utah 2012 res check which allows an equipment trade-off and that number just jumped from 3% to 4% January 1. So there's your first checklist item. Which method are you using? Do you comply? Question on any of those? Um, I didn't put a slide in here, but I, I can't go without uh, my favorite soapbox item. When you turn in a plan, and you turn in a res check, and you turn in a load calculation as required, and, even if, you, and if you have a specifications book or sheets for that set of plans, the R values, the U factors, the solar heat gain coefficients, the thermal performance specifications that you use to show compliance need to be the same on all the documents. You're not going to get a house built correctly if your res check says we're going to put R21 in the walls but your plan says we're putting R13 in the walls. We just need the consistency across those. Skipping down through here until we get to the building envelope and it's just the last column just before we turn the page and we talked about this briefly already the building thermal envelope shall comply with table 402.4.1.1 which is kind of summarized on the back this first list right here this is kind of a summary of what's in that table we either do that which includes all this ceiling of gaps and if you look down um, if you have drop ceilings you put a lid in them and you seal those so you're not trying to insulate and seal you've seen it you crawl in an attic and there's a big area that's dropped and all the insulation has fallen in and the insulation that's stuck on those little short walls has fallen in and we have no air barrier to ensure that it's airtight 
put a lid in it, let your attic blow just go across the top, seal that lid. That's what the, uh, this inspection checklist is requiring. If you have rim joist insulation, which you have to have, what do we see? We see bats shoved in it, right? Well, you have to have an air barrier on all six sides of the rim joist insulation. So I have all these eye joists running over and I shove a bat in it. I got an air barrier on the outside, I got it on the two sides, I have a top plate of the wall or the foundation coming up, I can create an air barrier there and I have a floor above, but I have nothing on the face of it. So are you going to go and take a piece of Tyvek and cut it to fit and staple it in there and caulk all the way around it? That's impossible. Your only alternative really, if you're meeting that checklist, is to spray closed cell foam. That's the only way you can effectively create that condition. So that's just a couple of items. We do all those things or we do the blower door test. And so the section options, the blower door test, which we just said, as of January 1, we have to be down to 3.5 air changes per hour at 50 pascals, which means we're approaching the three air changes per hour and we really should be planning on doing mechanical ventilation to play it safe. In fact, we should be putting it in anyway. Townhouses remain at the five air changes per hour, which was the rate before January 1 for all single family. And you can see Rocky Mountain Power for the HERS Raiders, or you can go to the website that we talked about early, utahenergycode.com, and we have a list of them there. Uh, duct ceiling, we went from the 35% to the 25% can be outside the thermal envelope, January 1. That's right here on it. And the testing tightened up from 8 CFM to 7 CFM. Any questions on that? Really, you have a question? Good. We got a microphone there. Alyssa will bring it over to you. Um, yeah. <laughs> this has to be done already, right? This we is should the code. be getting these at right now. Final. Or whenever they get whenever they do them. Yeah. We should be requiring them and getting them. That's right. And then my other question is on the insulation at the rim joist, does the craft facing work for that sixth side? The only way craft could possibly work if it wasn't torn or anything and you fit it in there and you cut it so it fit in you know, the shape of an eye joist and then you caulked foam sealed every edge all the way around. And then if you put, um, if it's sheetrocked on the bottom of that, would that be six sided? The face of the insulation has to be has to be the covered. Okay. The same thing goes to a knee wall. So you you build it you build an attic with a knee wall, right? Yeah. You need an air bear, and that's on the it, it's on the list. The back side of it. You see a lot of people using Tyvek for that. Yeah. Yep. You can use Tyvek, but you can't. Challenge there is most of the time we're doing R19 or R20 or R21 in our wall, and if the, it's an attic truss. It's three and a half, so we put a R19 or an R21 bat in it, and then we try to stretch Tyvek and staple it back every so often, and we're crushing insulation, and we, you know we've we've got issues. You know this this whole list talks about proper installation of air barriers and insulation, and in fact that's what we're going to be talking about on the 25th. We were talking about it before we started insulation. Bat insulation is never installed correctly. Has anybody ever seen a bat insulation? Go ahead. Well, um, no, I was just going to say the, the other thing that I'm seeing with these is that the, the, they'll put up that insulation, but then when you look at the, when you look at the manual J, the calyx on the right soft, they'll put in that the attic knee walls are R40, the same as the rest of the attic, and that ain't never been. Yep. And that's the consistency issue that I 
I probably brought it up every time I taught, haven't I? I think Go so. Go ahead. But real quick on the rim joist and is exterior sealing like with zip liquid or something, is that okay if you're sealing air barrier exterior of the rim joist? If it's bat type insulation, you have to have, and it's mounted vertically in a wall, you have to have six sided. To keep what, what, what do we have when we have vertical insulation? We have a cold surface and air on the, the, that's in contact with the cold surface is going to do what? It's going to drop when it, gets, it approaches a cold surface. So it drops and so we get a convective flow. And any place you have vertical insulation you get a convective flow and bad insulation. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to enclose it on all six sides so that if it's doing that, it's doing it within the encapsulated insulation, it's not flowing down and out into your unconditioned space and pulling unconditioned air back in. And basically, the, ins the insulation is not effective without it enclosed on all six sides. Did I say yeah. that right, Mitch? Um, well, one reason I ask you, I'm really trying to move my insulation out towards the cold side and keep the the barrier on the cold side so that the, the energy in the building can dry out any incidental moisture in the walls. But anyway, so it's you're, bigger than this discussion. And, no, and it's, it's okay. We got a second. So you're saying put, put foam on the outside? Foam, yeah, and sealed foam. Yep, that's... Yeah. You put sheet foam on the outside, great, super. And in fact, if even if the wall required R21 and you only put like 15 on the outside, right? I, myself, I would say you're meeting the intent. The surface on the inside okay. is going to be so warm that it, you're not going to get the convective flows and you can just beat the rest of it with just a piece of bat. Right. Isn't the frost number R10 with foam? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, otherwise you can have that moisture or, in there, yeah, in that area. Yeah. I mean, I'm saying minimums. Ten, 10's the number that generally uh, reduces the chance of condensation on the in inside Freezing. surface. Yeah. yeah. Okay, any other questions? Okay, we're going to break for lunch. Um, and when we get back in 10 minutes, we'll start talking about the commercial. Thank you and welcome back to the Utah Energy Code training lunch and learn. This, the topic of today's training is legislative updates on both residential and commercial energy codes and we're about to start the commercial side. I did want to say before we got started to just a reminder that you know Dominion and Rocky Mountain Power put a lot of emphasis on these trainings and they are the main funder uh, through the Office of Energy Development. And so there are also incentives and rebates that support a lot of these uh, upgrades and higher efficiency equipment. So just keep that in mind that both of those uh, programs, Rocky Mountain Powers, both residential and commercial programs can be found at wattsmart.com and, <clears throat> excuse me, Dominion Energy uh, at thermwise.com. So you can find energy rebates and incentives for builders and customers. So I also wanted to remind everyone or just point out that we're going to be having trainings this month. These are our only full day trainings uh, that we'll have for a good while, probably until next fall. <clears throat> and so on April 25th, we'll have understand insulation choices and improve the thermal envelope. And the nice thing about this is it's with building science expert Gord Cook. And the morning will be here, uh, actually not this room, but at Salt Lake Community College. And then in the afternoon, we'll be going to uh, an Ivory Homes development. So just so you know, uh, it should be a great tour and a review of their insulation and you know best practices. So the other one I want to point out is April 26th. That one is going to be commercial focused, and that will be commercial HVAC technology challenges and solutions. That also will be in the morning, a classroom portion. And then in the afternoon, we're actually going to take a tour of Adobe Systems building in Lehigh. So um, they have a very innovative system. And we'll get to hear from the engineering firm that designed that system, Colvin Engineering. And again, this will be supported by both Brent Ersenbach, 
providing us the details on code and by our building science expert, Gord Cook, who will get into best practices, what he sees across the country, you know, what, is, what are the most cost effective ways to meeting energy code and performing these uh, upgrades. So I will now turn the time over to Brent. Thank you, Becky. Just kind of add a little bit to that. Uh, and I don't know if I said this at the first or not, the energy code that we're talking about, whether it's amended or not, if we were on the full 2018 energy code without any amendments, we still are on a minimum code. We can do so much more and go so much further than that minimum code. And what do we do when we really build a code compliant building? We build a building that's not only energy efficient, but we build a building that's comfortable, that promotes good health because we're ventilating. There's, there's really no downside to building an energy efficient building and even going beyond the minimum requirements of the code. The code is not the latest and greatest technologies. There is so much more that we can go uh, further than, than that on. It's, uh, and it really, Well, we talked a lot about it when we talked about ERI path. I better not go down that one because we got other stuff we got to talk about. But we're making progress and you know, it's it's great, you know, that we see some new faces, but it's also great that we see faithful every time, you know, the same guys come um, and it's guys that are are trying to reach and and maybe make that better product. Um, now, I uh, put together here the 2018 code, commercial uh, energy code, has a number of updates. Now, I'll be the first to admit that the commercial code is a much more complex code. It's a, it's a really complex code. Uh, we have a big section on the envelope that's more comprehensive than the envelope section that we see in the residential. We have a big section on mechanical and you could spend, we could do classes for a week on the mechanical section of the code. So in, our, in 45 minutes we're going to touch on some of the changes but obviously I'm not going to have the time to go into real detail on every one of those pieces so what we're hoping is you um, are aware and maybe a little reminder for when you run into that project, you'll know what you need to be looking for. Now as far as state amendments, we have a grand total of one state amendment to the Commercial Energy Code and we have it right here. There is a requirement in the Commercial Energy Code when you have a high pressure duct system that's um, running at three inches water column or higher that's VAB high pressure, that's high pressure. You have to do a, a per, uh, at least 25% of the duct area needs to be tested um, to make sure it's airtight. If you have those high pressure duct systems, they leak. It's not that we're losing heating and cooling as they whistle like crazy because we're pushing the air through it so fast. And the, the whole amendment is documentation shall be furnished by the designer d demonstrating that that test took place. Well, why is the mechanical engineer providing that documentation? He's not the one that's going to be doing the test. And so our amendment simply crosses out by the, by the designer and says, you have to provide the documentation. And of course it's got to be provided by someone certified to do testing and stuff. It's going to be a balancing firm typically on those big things that are doing that. And um, so that's that's the extent of the amendments. So if Becky wanted me to talk about commercial amendments, we'd be done and we'd go home. But we have some more to talk about. And one other note I want to make, and I might have mentioned this earlier, we talked about the lighting last month, commercial lighting. And so I did mention it. So if you want to, go and to the website and you can review that. So I'm going to only touch on changes in the 2018 commercial energy that impact the envelope or the mechanical system. 
and I'm only hitting on the major ones. There's lots of little ones that occurred through there that are just clean up clarifications, improve the grammar. Um, so let's get going. And this is one of those that's clean up, but it eliminates some confusion. The code used to say, well, let me back up and review. A commercial building, when we talk about the code, and if we were to go all the way to the front slide, or one of the first slides where we talked about all the different codes, we had the IBC and the IPC and the IMC and the IFGC, and we kind of refer to those as commercial codes. You know, the plumbing, the building, the mechanical, and all those codes. They're individual standalone codes that just cover that specific component of building construction. We get to the IRC and it's all inclusive, includes all of those for residential. And so if you look at the front of your IRC, it says one and two family dwellings. And that includes townhouses because they're single family dwellings, you know, right next to each other. Anything bigger than a two family dwelling is a commercial building in every code except the, res except the energy code. So if you build a fourplex, the fourplex is a, you know, whether it's four units side by side or two and two on top of each other, that fourplex is a commercial building. But it fits the definition of a residential building for energy. So any R occupancy other than hotels and motels, so any apartments or anything else, R's, twos, threes, and fours, any of those built three stories or less has to comply with the residential provisions of the code and all the amendments and everything else. As soon as you go to four stories, then it's a commercial energy building. So it's a commercial building on everything but energy. When you go past three stories, it's a commercial building. And that even goes forward to say, and it's been this way for a while, you can have a building that's two stories or three stories out of the ground and the lower level can be a commercial building and have to comply with the commercial requirements of the energy code. But if the next story or the next two stories are residential, they have to comply with the residential requirements in the energy code. Um, the clarification is that they added the word, uh, it said treat the residential building under the applicable residential code and there was some confusion so they've added building portion. So you can have a building and a portion of it, and that was the whole intent, a portion of it is residential and a portion of it is commercial. Now point of clarification, I get this question quite a bit. It's three stories above grade. That's the trigger. As Soon as you go above three stories above grade, then it's a commercial building on the energy code. If you have parking underground and the first level of the apartments is residential or commercial and you're only three stories above grade, then the residential part of that stays residential. So it's all um, with reference to, to grade. Please, Troy. Where's them? Now, even if you go above four stories, the lighting portion stays residential within the dwelling units, though, right? As long as it's R two, three, or four. We talked yeah. about that a month ago. Yeah. That was revolutionary. Yeah, too. yeah. It, it, it's it's kind of weird when you get taller than that. Well, we have requirements in the commercial side. It's not fully. Um, no, it refers you, yeah, we talked about that. Yeah. It refers you to the 75% high efficacy light bulbs. Okay. So yeah, we treat the dwellings. But if it's a hotel or motel, that's an R1. Right. That's always commercial. A two-story hotel is commercial. Yeah, okay. good, thanks. Any question on that? I know it's confusing. And the reason it's that way is ASHRAE's been that way, ASHRAE 19.1, forever. If you go to ASHRAE standards, um, ASHRAE 90.1 is for um, buildings above three, 
Well, they have for buildings below it, but they have one for buildings above more than three stories. In fact, that's what they call them. You know, it says right on the title 90.1 for buildings greater than three stories. Okay, I, I think we need to spend a little bit of time on this one, especially since we have, and we have some building officials in here. Um, we have this section in the code, C102.1, alternate materials, designs, methods of construction and equipment. And it might be a little bit different number in the IBC or the IMC or something, but every one of the codes has this alternative materials, designs, and methods. And I think those of us as code officials and those of us are builders and design professionals, we need to, to be aware of this section in the code and we need to, to use it to our advantage. Um, I mean, we have things, in fact, I'm sure we're going to see on the 26th when we go down to Adobe, I'm going to, I would guess, I'm almost positive we're going to see indirect direct evap cooling. I would be pretty, wouldn't you guess that, Becky? I'm pretty sure we're going to see that. And in fact, we'll be talking about that there. Indirect and direct evap cooling, which is very common in our high-end buildings around here, is a swamp cooler raised to the hundredth level, right? And very, very effective. Very high-end buildings, you know, the very high-end buildings are using evap cooling, but it's not recognized by the code. And the code, rec the code does tell us that we need to do some enhanced energy efficiency, you know, we have to pick one item and make, that makes our building a little bit better, and the code doesn't recognize that. But with alternate methods, a designer in Utah can say, well, you know what, I'm putting indirect direct evap cooling in this, and with just the minimal documentation can show that it's a huge energy savings. I did the review on the Facebook building that's being built out in Eagle Mountain. 980 something thousand square feet. And it's built like an H. And the two long legs of the H are like 1,250 feet long. And I can't remember how wide they were, but they're 100 and something feet wide, each one of them. And those two long legs are nothing but racks and racks of servers. The whole thing, every bit of the, the ITs, the server stuff, is being <coughs> cooled by VAP cooling, 100%. It's not recognized in the code, but it's definitely a great alternative because how much are they saving cooling that way rather than how many thousands and thousands of tons of chiller would that take to cool that much? I can't even wrap my head around how much chiller that would be. I mean, the, the mechanical design on that one will literally save hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars every year in cooling expense. It's an alternative method. So don't be afraid to, if you have a way of doing something that you can show the code official, it is, um, that it's effective and you ask for approval where the code official can find the proposed design is satisfactory and complies with the intent and the provisions and materials or methods. All of these things, effectiveness, fire resistance. If you comply with all these requirements with the code and you submit that, then guess what? The building official should approve it. And if he doesn't approve it, this is new, both of these things are new. He has to tell you in, in writing why. So if Trent, and I know Trent real well so I can give him a bad time. If Trent comes in and has a bad day and wants to be a jerk, he can't say, no, I'm not gonna approve that. He'd have to put in writing why he didn't approve it. So 
the code official has the responsibility to look at it and verify if it meets all of these things. <coughs> and if it does, then he approves it. We really, where else could we use this? We didn't adopt, and I'm not putting words in the code official's mouth, we did not adopt the 2018 code on the residential side, everything, but there's some good things in it. If I were a builder and I wanted to take advantage of some of the good things that are effective and maybe streamline your building process in the 18 code, I certainly could go to the code official and say, hey, the 18 code allows you to do this and this and this and it provides, it meets the intent and everything else. I would like to do it this way. Why not? Mitch? Hi. Wait a second, <laughs> Becky, Becky's got to get the microphone to you. I was just going to say you could use an energy rater, uh, either a builder or a code official to help you sort this bit out. Absolutely. Computer modeling the works. Great, great point. One, one thing real quick that, that you could use this on. The 2018 code, and I know I'm dropping back to residential. All of you that do residential work know that if you put in a range hood that's more than 400 CFM, you have to do what? Makeup Provide makeup air, right? Because, why is that in the code? Because the concern is if you put too much exhaust, on a standard home, you're going to reverse the B vent and you're going to suck products of combustion into your house rather than them by natural draft going up the B vent out of your house. The 2018 code says if all your gas appliances in your house are direct vent, so they're sealed, they don't see the indoor environment, you don't have to provide the makeup air. You've eliminated the risk, so you don't have to provide the makeup air. So, I, I think this is an important one we need to think about. Um, the commercial code now identifies that we specifically need to have insulation inspections at footing and foundation when, when that applies, and we need to look at all the thermal envelope and all the plumbing systems, mechanical systems, electrical systems, because every single one of them have energy components in them we don't normally see insulation inspections ordered with foundations, but at some point when that foundation's poured, we need to, we need to hit those. <coughs> In my 13 years of inspecting, I'd go on plumbing inspections so many times, and it's all backfilled and everything, and the plan's called for slab edge insulation. You know, you have to be paying attention and catch those so that that gets done they think, well, we did our plumbing inspection, we can pour a floor. No, we need to make sure the inspections are taking place that need to take place. So many of you have seen this before. The ways, the options you have to comply with the commercial energy code include, number one, you can pick ASHRAE. Now that's the, I was trying to think of the title. Energy standard for buildings except low-rise residential building. And that's can only be used for buildings more than three stories high. But you can use that and you have to use it for everything. Envelope, mechanical, lighting, everything. Or you use the IECC and that's what we're focusing on. So you choose the IECC and we have all these requirements. Envelope, mechanical, service water heating, lighting, and the code for now, three code cycles, it says, and pick at least one of these Efficient HVAC performance, you put in better HVAC or you use reduced lighting, you use a different table where you use even less watts per foot for your lighting or lighting controls, automatic control and all, all your lighting. Uh, On-site renewables, dedicated outdoor air systems and high efficiency service water heating. And that applies only when you're using lots of hot water like hotels or something like that. New in the 18 code, enhanced envelope performance and reduced air infiltration. This list doesn't include indirect direct evap cooling because most of the country 
can't take advantage of indirect direct evap cooling <coughs> because they're too humid. But we can, and that is the prime place that the design professional should say, hey, I don't need to worry about any of those. I'm doing um, IDEC, I'm doing IDEC, and that's going to be my uh, enhanced energy efficiency selection for the project. Perfect place. So those two are new, and we'll talk about those a little bit. The whole intent here is that we basically build a building that we think is pretty good, and then we have a choice on how we want to pick up the last 15% or so of the energy efficiency. And so we do it through one of these. If you do the performance model, it's the same thing. You go through the whole list, and then you show that you're 15% more efficient through your design of the building. So either one of them is saying, yeah, we want you to build a pretty good building, but we wanted you to take it 15% further. And that's been in the energy code now for, this is the third code cycle, so it started in the 12. Started in the 12 with three, then it went to six, and now it's gone to eight. So our um, additional energy uh, efficiency package, this one's one of the existing. I don't want to spend a lot of time on it. This is um, reduce energy on your service water heating, and it's basically in places that you have a huge water heating supply or demand. Enhanced envelope performance. It's pretty simple. You do a comm check, and you pass by 15% on your envelope. You build an envelope that's 15% better than just the minimum pass rate. Now you're going to have to do some, some good stuff in that envelope to do that, but it's pretty straightforward. Here's the next one. Mitch, do you have 12 blower doors? I've got 11. <laughs> <laughs> <Just shy. laughs> Are you going to be doing that on a building? Yeah. So this is one of those, the second of those, those, those options. Sorry, I should have waited for the mic before I let you answer. But um, reduced air infiltration. So basically, and I don't need to read through the whole thing, but let's touch on it. <coughs> you verify that you've reduced air infiltration by blower door testing and has to be by an independent third party and I see one, two, at least four, four or five of them in here that do that stuff. Um, take pictures, Mitch, when you do that one on a big building. Um, measure air leakage and in here they, they re ask you to do it by square footage not by volume, um, and you take it to 75 pascals instead of 50, and you uh, do the blower door testing and show that you've reduced the leakage where it's not more than a 0.25 CFM per square foot under that 75 pascals. And then you submit, submit the report to the building official, building owner, and we have an exception there. If it's more than a quarter million square feet, you only have to test a minimum of 25% of the building. That's a big building, isn't it? So there's another option. Why is, why is the code moving towards testing so much? Because it works. It verifies. Why have we... My very first day doing HVAC, I went out and helped the pipe fitter do gas lines. And guess what we did? This was in June of 1972. We pressure tested it when we finished the gas line. And I've never done a gas line that I didn't pressure test. Always pressure test the gas line, right? Plumbers always test their drainage. They test their water lines. Why don't we test our buildings and make sure? that they're, they're tight. Any question on that? If you do one like that, I want to know, guys. 
I'm going to come see 12, 12 or 15 blowers going all at the same time. I threw this one in just because I get questions on it. And I've had it, I, I, it was pretty quiet for a long time. And then this last year, I've had about 10 questions on this. You cannot, in this building, say, well, you know what? It's easier for me to buy pre-cut insulation in two foot by four foot, foot sections and lay them on top of my tile. Well, you can do it, but you get absolutely no credit for thermal insulation on your building. Why? Because the second the Comcast guy or the CenturyLink guy or anybody else came in, where would the insulation be? Everywhere, some of it thrown away, right? It'd be the same place that that bad insulation that's over your attic that's supposed to be over your attic access would be off to the side. So that doesn't count. It's just a reminder. One of the next things they did, Sorry. please. Oh, Becky, microphone. Respect for those online. Oh, I was wondering why the second picture was included. I, it, it looked like it was up in the, between the joists. Because that's correct. Good question. Yeah, here trying to, you know, to lay it down on the tiles. Um, you know, that was what they were trying to do here. You know, the, t the it's right up tight against it. This one is correct. It's completely up away, and we don't have an airspace above it. The next one, uh, there's there's two things to this change. It doesn't look like a big one, but the first one is. It used to say controls installed in top light, and they just improved the grammar, and it says top lit everywhere. So it's side lit and top lit rather than light because it just didn't read right. But currently the code says if you have um, skylights, you're limited to 3% of the roof area. But then the 15 code said, however, if you're using the skylights with lighting controls, daylight lighting controls, you can go up to 5%. So what we're doing is we're trading off. You put in skylights, and instead of R30 insulation, you have like R2 or R3 insulation in the area of the skylight. So if you put lots of skylight, you have a poor performing thermal component on your building. But the value of natural light, rather than producing artificial light, you know, at some point in time, it's worth having a little bit more skylight because of the value in providing a top lit zone through your skylights. And so you can go as far as 6% now if you have automatic daylight controls. Now what are automatic daylight controls? You might have been in a big box store or a store at some time, and you go, wait a minute, did the lights just go down? And maybe some of them turned off or they all dimmed and went down a level. You can save a lot of energy as the lighting comes in, is sufficient to take care of it. The lights automatically stage off. And they can go clear to off if, if, if you have enough light coming in from outside. So, that's a change there. The next one, and this is something that we, could, we probably should um, talk about more often. The commercial code on, on air barriers, it's, it's, a little, it's a little bit different. I mean, it does allow blower door testing as one of your options. But it talks about materials like drywall and OSB and all these other products are actually approved air barriers. OSB is actually a good air barrier. Drywall is a good air barrier. We don't get a lot of air through it. But, and polyiso foam is a good air barrier. You put polyiso on the outside of the building and it's a, it's a good air barrier. And then we go and tape the seams because the code requires you to do something to the seams and we tape it, the foam with Tyvek tape and guess what? They pull the cladding off a year or two later, and it's cracked on every seam 
where they put the Tyvek tape. Why? Because the Tyvek tape doesn't expand and contract the same as the polyiso. And so the polyiso is doing this stuff, and so the tape cracks at all the seams. And so the code chain says the ceiling has to allow for expansion and contraction and mechanical vibration. So what's that basically saying? If you're putting up a product, you need to make sure you're providing a product that is going to provide the expansion and contraction when you do the ceiling. You know, some of the materials, the, I don't use a brand name, but some of these OSB sidings that have green coatings and stuff like that on them, <laughs> <laughs> they require a sealing of the seams. If you use the wrong material, it's not going to work, right? You're laughing, Troy. Yeah, who knows what you're talking about? I, I don't know. <laughs> um, and then we're, that was just a number change. Heated or cooled vestibules. This is one I've been wondering about, and I'm glad we finally did something with it. If um, you have a heating system in a vestibule, it has to have some type of individual control to it. What value is there a vestibule, in a vestibule if you're dumping heated air and cooled air in at the same rate that you're dumping in the rest of the building? <laughs> There's virtually no value, is there? Maybe a little bit on air leakage, but <clears throat> they have to be configured so that they simply shut off when it's 45 degrees or warmer outside, or it's greater than 45 outside. And the thermostats for heating can't be set higher than 60 degrees, and for cooling they can't be set lower than 85 degrees. So that, yeah, if you decide to provide some heating and cooling in there, you can't take it all the way to the level that you're doing in the building. <clears throat> and you have an exception. You know, if, if you're using exhausted air to heat it, we don't care. Air you're throwing away as part of your ventilation system or site recovered energy. Hydronic systems, pumps, we <coughs> It's amazing how much energy we can use in a building with pumps moving water around, whether it's chilled water or heated water around in there. And we've, we've done a pretty good job in the energy code addressing um, efficiency in fans and requiring freak drives and you know, variable frequency drives on fans and stuff. And we've been a little bit behind on some of the pumps. And without going real deep into this, our pumps don't need to flow the same rate all the time. As our load varies, we have to speed our pump up or slow our pump down. We need fewer BTUs out there. And so when we go over two horsepower, the code is saying you need to have a variable speed drive where you can modulate the speed of the pump. And they need to and where you have direct digital controls, you need to have uh, those connected with that zone. And basically, we don't run a pump any more than we have to. Um, and we want it to, when we get down to 50% um, of the design water flow, we should only be using 30% of the energy. And this is all doable with, with our variable frequency drives on our pumps. So it's just giving us some direction on how to save money on operation of the pumps. Pumps actually use a lot of horsepower because it's more expensive to pump water than it is to, to blow air around. Uh, ventilation systems. Now your commercial buildings, you're going to see ventilation on all of those because the code just about requires it in every installation. Uh, what this one is saying when so we have um, heating and cooling systems that are always bringing in this ventilation air. And so we'll have these, these makeup air units, if that's what you, I mean, or direct <coughs> dedicated outdoor air systems that are just providing outside air into your building. And it might be feeding it in with your VAV boxes or, um, or just independently and discharging a little bit of fresh air into each each space, 
And this is another one of those things. When we get to 60 degrees, we need to cut that stuff off. We need to quit reheating to the last little bit. Um, this is one that, has anybody stayed in a brand new hotel lately? Um, someone, when I was down in St. George teaching last month, had stayed in a brand new one that he had to put his key, his hotel door key, in the, the little thing on the wall so that, what? So the lighting worked and so the heating and air conditioning worked. So you don't leave it on running and running and running. So some of these things that they do, these controls that they're putting in the hotels, motels now, they have smart power outlets, they have occupancy sensors, they have smart light switches, they have door sensors, thermostats, or they might have a software package or somewhere put you, where you put your key card. For these systems, room occupancy sensors it can either be an occupant sensor or a card key. And then there's something else on here. For those systems, unrented rooms can be determined from a signal by the reservation center and they literally start shutting stuff down. If you look at the next slide, slide 32, let's just read through these real quick. It needs to be capable of automatically raising cooling set point and lowering heat set point by not less than four degrees from occupant set, po occupant set point within 30 minutes of the occupant leaving. So it's automatically supposed to set down and automatically raise. Yeah, you probably ought to just try it again. Um, and then uh, down below, not um, network control systems capable of returning thermostat set points to default occupant set points 60 minutes prior to guest room scheduled to be occupied. So you can do lots of things with it. The if you, I know that when I um, stay in a hotel, I'm always getting an email saying um, if you want to check in before you arrive. Uh, I can do that. Well, if I give them a check-in time, they can an hour before with these controls, they can cool my room or heat it up. I usually, when I, when I travel, it seems that um, I go to Texas quite a bit, and when I go to Houston, when I get there, my room is always set way down so that it's comfortable when I get there because it's hot and humid and miserable in Houston. Slide 32, that control can, you can have it set so that we don't get the relative humidity too high when it's unoccupied. And the last thing, if you go to slide 33, that I wanted to touch on is it's capable of automatically turning off ventilation and exhaust fans within 30 minutes of the occupant leaving or isolation devices that automatically shut off supply of outdoor air. So basically, what they're saying is we want to shut off that ventilation that you don't need to do when someone's in there. However, we don't want it sitting with no ventilation for a couple of days. And, uh, and so uh, it needs to have uh, an automatic daily purge cycle where you can ensure that we don't let the room get too humid or um, smells or, or whatever it may be. Heat traps on water heaters. It is showing online? Yep. Okay. Heat traps on water heaters. Storage tank water heaters have to have heat traps. And, I need, and this is completely, 
on your handout here, it's not in red text, but the whole section has been rewritten on C404.3. Um, so the heat traps are, are required on all of those, and tank inlets and outlets associated with solar water heating systems that have circulation loops where we're always circulating, they don't need to have them. So basically what we're trying to do is prevent waste of heat, that heat's just migrating off the top of your water heater. And so we have heat traps. If we have a circulation system where we're always circulating hot water, that's not an issue because we're going to insulate that line all the way around uh, and that pump's going to be running hot water through it all the time. Pool covers. What's been added to this one is um, you get an exception to having these approved heel, uh, pool covers. Um, where you're deriving 75% uh, of your operating season energy from site recovery. So we don't need one of these vapor retardant pool covers on there if we're um, using renewable energy for our, for our pool heat. And then maintenance information system commissioning. This is completely rewritten. Now our challenge with, with maintenance and, and commissioning equipment is when do we provide it? And and what's really required. This is just giving them a little bit more clarification on what needs to be provided on our maintenance and system, system commissioning. We were talking to the, one of the gentlemen from Davis County and uh, we were talking about the value of commissioning the building. Well, what value is there in commissioning the building if we don't have all the documentation we need to maintain the building once it's commissioned? And you may or may not uh, recall that over the past um, two code cycles, it used to be that the code just said you, we need to provide com the ability to commission the building, test ports and stuff like that, and now we have triggers when you absolutely have to commission the buildings and ensure everything's set up and operating the way it's supposed to. If you go to slide 37, I um, just want to focus on um, the new text is in the second bullet point report to be organized with mechanical and service water heating findings in separate sections to allow independent review. Reports shall include commissioning compliance checklist and it refers to a figure uh, C48.2.4 and identified as preliminary commissioning report. This report needs to be provided at final. A preliminary report needs to be provided at final. We don't want to say, oh, I know you're not finished with your commissioning, because you're not, but you at least need to have that preliminary report uh, before we final the building. And this is giving the code official direction that he cannot pass the mechanical inspection until he's received that commissioning report, pre-commissioning report. And then the last item I just want to touch on real quick is if you're using that high pressure duct system, slide 39, and it's underground, it also needs to be pressure tested, just like above grade spiral pipe systems. Thanks so much. I'm sorry about the uh, computer snafu there, but we got through it. Fortunately, it was close to the end, not, to, not at the first. And make sure you remember our two trainings on the 25th and 26th, because they're going to be really, really good. Thank you.